Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Sandy Rosenthal, host of Beat the Big Guys, and I'm so excited about the guest that I have with us today. Hello. Welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited. You know, I forgot to ask you, uh, how would you like me to, what, what would you like me to call you? Alex, please. Alex. Okay. Alex, it is. Welcome, Alex. Um, I've thoroughly researched my guest, but some of you out there may not be familiar with her, so I'm going to bring you up to speed right now. When Alex Allred learned that women were not allowed in bobsled, she lobbied for equal status and would ultimately win the U.S. Nationals in September 1994, making sports history as she was named to the first ever U.S. women's bobsled team. This is amazing. When the United States Olympic Committee named Ms. Allred, Alex, Athlete of the Year for her, for her sport, it made international news as Allred was pregnant when she made the team. Alex is an adjunct professor at Tarleton State University and Navarro College and author of seven books. A fourth degree black belt, she has retired from competitive fighting, but continues to offer free self-defense and health wellness classes for those living with special needs because Alex feels everyone deserves to be empowered. That is phenomenal. Again, welcome, Alex. Oh, thank you. So um, I love your free classes idea. I just think that is just so amazing uh, because I really feel that people with special needs deserve your services more, almost, I think it could be argued more than anyone else, right? Oh, absolutely. And there's two, so there's two groups really. When we say special populations within the fitness industry, um, Special populations are people with heart disease, obesity, geriatrics, diabetes, pregnancy, I mean, arthritis. And so that's what the fitness industry calls special populations. And that's problematic because then people with special needs really got pushed to the side and the medical uh, insurance, wellness, health industries just kind of forgot them. And there's right now, there's 1.2 billion people are worldwide living with some form of disability. And so when you've got the fitness industry not designing for them in some kind of way, they're just ignored. And I would love to tell you that I just intuitively knew that, but I was on college, I was on the Navarro College campus and I was going to one of my classes and I saw this group of young adults kind of moving in a mob together. And I, it kind of slowed me up and I went over to their instructor and I said, so what class is this? Because it was very clear that there were many who had cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. And so I asked and she said, oh, this is our, um, our Elevate program and we're, it's an inclusion program. And I thought, there's nothing inclusive about this. I mean, they, they were really in a tight mob moving along, eyes downcast. And they weren't blending at all. So I went to the dean of my campus and I asked, can I bring these, this class into my class and make them pair up while I was teaching? I think that semester I was teaching Pilates and uh, kickboxing. And he said, yeah, I love it. And I remember I went to my students beforehand and I said, this is who's coming. And I, I swear, I will break your kneecaps in the parking lot if you make them not feel welcome. <laughs> And I was not prepared for how fantastic uh, my then millennials were, where they were actually going, you know, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me to the, to the new class that had come in. And it just started something on campus. And from there, I realized I got to take this off campus. That is and amazing. And so I took it to a gym. Yeah. And it's just, I So it's getting... also about assimilation. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes. You know, and I'll tell you the beautiful thing about that. And it continues to this day is the mainstream uh, students or gym members will always come up to me and say, thank you. I, I had no idea. And so it's really both communities are giving so much to each other. It's just beautiful. It's that is phenomenal. Beautiful. That is really beautiful. And it's such, and I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that I was only telling our listeners a, a for action of the story. So thank you for filling, filling us in on that. Now I feel unworthy because I was feeling all good. I feel was feeling so good about myself because during COVID for an entire year, 
I offered free yoga classes to my oh, colleagues. I, I'm actually a retired fitness instructor, and this was my op opportunity to give back. And what I did is every Tuesday and Thursday, I offered a, a yoga class on Zoom for all these ladies. Uh, it was mostly ladies who uh, could not go to their, could not, couldn't play tennis and play as all, we yeah. all remember, we couldn't get yeah. our exercise. And so this was an opportunity, not only just for the physical, but for the mental and the social as well. And I did this for free for 52 weeks. That's I did amazing. this. And then, um, and then I said, okay, that's it. You know, it. You're on your own. But I thought that was amazing. But what you did was a definitely a step beyond. Oh, and oh no, I would argue that because we all know how um, anxiety and depression rose during that time. So you have no idea how many you may have really saved them. So thank you for that. And also I noticed in doing my research that you have done goat yoga. I saw a picture of you <laughs> with a little goat on your back. <laughs> I've always wanted to try goat yoga. Oh my gosh. And I, all I can say to that is why haven't you done goat yoga? <laughs> Everyone should do goat yoga. Well, I am going to have to figure out a way to make that happen. So I, oh, I now have my marching orders. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll tell you, I went up, so a group of friends of, my, of mine and um, my, my sister and I, we all did goat yoga and it's impossible not to be giggling. And even as I did it, I thought, oh my gosh, my special needs guys need to do this. And so we actually did a fundraiser and I found someone who had goats and we brought the goats in and we did goat yoga for the special population still. So well, I now, fun. I now have my homework cut out for me. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. I mean, we've, there's always something we haven't tried yet and, but we've thought about and talked about, but haven't done it. So thank oh you. Oh my gosh. Yes. That. So uh, let's, but enough about me and my marching orders. Um, uh -huh. Let's talk about Alex Allred and the amazing things she's done. So uh, this podcast is called Beat the Big Guys, uh, where the goal of each episode is to arm and educate listeners with tools and tricks that they need to beat the big guys in his or her or their own neighborhood. So yeah. do you have a favorite one or two stories that you'd like to share with us where you either beat the big guys outright or took a big step in that direction? You know what? And I, thank you, thank you, thank you for this. Yeah, there's there's two actually, um, very different and the same. So you opened up and you read that during um, in 1993 when I learned that women weren't allowed to bobsled. Of course, I was intrigued. I looked into it, and at that time, I was a competitive fighter. So I thought, how could you not have women in bobsledding? So I started writing uh, campaign letters. Just I, the IOC, the USOC, the the bobsled federation. And flash forward, you see the result. But after that was done, um, and a lot of people look at that as my act of activism, but after um, I was named to the team and we had this team, a coach actually walked up to us and said, you know, this doesn't change anything. And I thought, what, what? I mean, Sports Illustrated was there. It was a, and the men felt that the, the sport is so expensive. It's the most, bobsledding is the most expensive winter Olympic sport. And the men were afraid that by bringing women in, it was going to take money from them. And so we, yeah. And so they, nobody wanted us there. And it, that was made very, very clear. And so they were doing all kinds of stalling techniques, including um, they would say, well, you're not officially team because there's not even any bylaws. And so I always tell my, my college students, I said, all right, fine. And I did some research and a teammate, Liz Parsmedstad and I, we wrote, we wrote the first ever women's bylaws. And Geeks then they came rule back. the world. Geeks yeah, I mean, rule the world. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, just little things like that. And then the second thing was, and they said, well, where do you think you're going to get the money? So we found a sponsor. And in the end, the end of the day and in the end of the story is our sponsor wound up paying for the men's travel when they got strapped. So we really made, we lifted everyone up. And so I was win. Yeah, it was and truly. And then we were on the United States was on a 50 year streak of not winning a gold medal in the, in the world of bobsledding. And in 2002, the Salt Lake Games, Jill Bakken won the first gold medal for the United States in 50 years of the woman that nobody wanted there. Right. So but so I always tell my students and anyone listening, 
sometimes something as obscure as, oh, well, there's no bylaws. Okay, well, don't let that be the thing that stops you. Figure out what the bylaws are. And I bet you nine times out of 10, you got it in you to do it. And then I'd say the second thing, and this was how I met um, Kane Daryl, that she's our, for those listening, she's, she's the common denominator between Sandy and I. Um, yeah, we were, it's just amazing how many people were afraid of the giant. And in, in Midlothian, Texas, there were three cement plants. And at that time they were emitting, we were taking in hazardous waste from seven states that did not want their own hazardous waste and Puerto Rico. And not only were we taking that in, our, some, our three cement plants were getting paid to take that off their hands. And then they use that to burn because for a cement kiln, it takes a lot of heat, extreme heat to produce uh, cement. And so then they were burning that for free at a profit to and emitting all that into the air to produce their product, right? And so I remember that um, when I found out about that, you know, my first thought was, well, of, of course I'm going to protest this. My kids were, we just moved there and my son was hospitalized six times in 10 months and I couldn't figure out what it was. And it was, it was you know, you, you, he's breathing hazardous waste. And so we tried to fight that. And I remember this is, this isn't a, I won, but it was a, I won. So I was at an EPA hearing and every person who would go up to speak, they would have to give their name, their address, and then say their, their thing. And I walked up to the microphone and all the lawyers from one of the cement plants was there. And as I said, my name is Alexandra. And he interrupted me and said, yeah, we know who you are, Alex. We know where you live. And I, it took me back for a second, which was exactly what he meant to do because it was a scare tactic. And, but here I tell my students again is I had to think on it for a second. And I went ahead and gave my spiel. But after that, I realized, you know, I'm, I'm under their skin because if I'm on their radar and they felt the need before 200 people to, to use that, that tactic, I'm under their skin. And so I always say, that's a win, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And then flash forward about five years when I went to before the U.S. Senate to testify before the EPA, I thought, I know who I know who all the players are. I know they're going to be there again. And so I got cardboard and I created two cement stacks and I had my daughter and her best friend dressed up as walking cement stacks because I thought we're going to make this funny, but we're also going to make this a photo opportunity and a talking point. And uh, I won't. I, w I won't say exactly what the guy said, but when they called my name, uh, next speaker, Alexander Albright from Midlothian, Texas, and, and there was a pause and you could hear all this laughter and the, the speaker said, and the two walking cement stacks. And then I heard one of the big head guys from the cement industry go, oh, shh. You know, and, and, and you can was, say that on my podcast. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He did. He's right really loudly. He goes, Oh, shit. <laughs> and then everybody burst out laughing because everyone knew this was going to be the moment that everybody remembered. Everybody was talking about, you mm -hmm. know, and how do you get angry with two adorable little girls? And <laughs> so, yeah, those are, those are, I would say when I knew that I had the upper hand for sure, um, that those are definitely it. Well, well, first of all, you get a prize for giving the most succinct to the point, two stories, not one, but two stories in a beautifully small period of time. Oh, yes. That's something <laughs> that I wish um, I could um, give some of my clients, no names, of course, <laughs> but some of them can speak for 20 minutes and never get, wrap it up. But you've just done it beautifully with not one, but two stories. So, and there's, that's a cool thing. That's a good thing. Uh, how many times, how many times have you had to give what I would call the elevator speech, explaining to oh. someone what it is you're trying to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. And I, if you, I don't know if you just happened to ask this or if you know something that Kane told you, but when we were up in DC, I saw at that time, um, we, we got to meet uh, Barack Obama. And oh. at that time I saw one of his uh, right-hand men and he was stepping into an elevator. And I remember I had a handful of stuff and I pushed it off and I said, this is my elevator speech. And I squeezed myself into the elevator and I pounced <laughs> and I did. And I wrapped it up in about a minute and a half. 
<laughs> and kudos to you. And there will be, and, and for all you listeners out there, that will happen to you because yes. pe the people who have the power to, to, to make the changes, to make your community better, are often very busy and only have 90 seconds. Yes. That's just the way it is. Yes. Yeah. And I'm so glad you said that too, because the one thing I try to tell um, my students now, we, we have a segment and I teach that talks about activism, social justice, and which is, I was teaching this a decade ago, but now it's so, it's, it's, it's who we are now. And the one thing I keep trying to tell my, I call my kids, but they're young adults. I try to tell my students all the time, you know, the thing is anger does not get you anywhere. It, you you lose your audience immediately. But if you are funny, if you find a common ground, if you're coming at them from a place, you need to study who you're going to go talk to, so that then you know that you can come at come at them at a place where they you, there is a common ground between you, and that's lost. I think there's an art form that we've kind of lost right now because everybody's mad. I don't care where you are, everybody's mad. I devoted a section of my book to exactly what yes. um, my guest just talked about. It says you cannot be angry. And not only will you never convince anyone with anger, it's, it's not good for your soul to, to remain angry. No, it'll, it will eat you up. And um, I know, I happen to know that you've got a phenomenal guest speaker coming in the future. Um, Jim Schirmbeck of mm -hmm. Downwinders is an amazing guy. And, uh, you know, I remember he and I spoke a long time ago and he said that People don't last long in the activism business because it'll just, it'll eat you up. It really will. If you let it, if you let it. That's very good advice. So you, you touched on a couple of really important, important points that I think are so critically important that we should talk about it just a little bit more. And the, one of the more recent ones that you mentioned was um, you did a photo op, but you added humor to it. So, so you had an effective photo, uh, photo op opportunity, a camera opportunity, but that had humor to it. And, yes. and that is, I, I can't, I, it's kind of contingent on what we, we just spoke about. You can't be angry. And a photo op that can be remembered that's got, got a little funny is, is, is going to travel much further and, and get much more um, resonance than an angry photo op. Yes, it, that, that is an absolute fact. And then the thing is too is, and everybody knows this story, you know, they always say the, the way to really beat someone is to not let them see that you're beat. And so, you know, it, it really is true. And so if you're out there fighting for a good cause, whatever that may be, and you're really passionate about it, but you also appear to be positive and, and having a, a good or, you know, proud time doing it, it's kind of hard to beat you down. It's when, when you see how angry people are, they're losing grip and they're doing destructive things. Um, that's when the other side be begins to say, I'm winning. I'm winning because, yeah, humor is huge. It's I, I huge. Think, again, yeah, we, we got a um, Jim Schirmbeck again, um, arranged to have a giant Rick Perry head, the former governor of Texas. And uh, because he was just allowing so many things to happen. And we used my uh, flatbed trailer to put it on. And at one point, a friend of mine and I had to transport it. We were drive, we were taking it into DC. I mean, I'm sorry, into Dallas for a protest. And it was really funny because we had a bet between us. I'd say, okay, because it was a gi gigantic Rick Perry head on, you know, going down the highway. And so I, sometimes I'd look at Gina and I'd go, all right, this guy, and we would bet. He's, he's going to wave or he's going to flip us off, you know, like, because we're in Texas. And so a lot of times it was like, you know, Hong Kong, and then they're doing this or thumbs up. And then other times it was Hong Kong and they're flipping us the bird, <laughs> you know, and then we would just burst out laughing because we had already bet on which way it was going to go. So even if we got flipped off, the per what the person saw was we were just having a fantastic time. And, and, we that, and that was a collaborative, your flatbed tr truck, no, his big head, Mr. Yeah. Schoenbeck's big head. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so and 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 collaborations is worthy of an entire another episode. Ooh, but yeah. nobody, and as wonderful as my guest is, she couldn't do her work alone. No way, no way, <laughs> no way. So and, and but that's that's another episode for another day. Uh, also, when possible, in your photo ops or your video, one of the things in in my book, Words Whispered in Water, we discussed is we did a video, um, with a one minute video, a spoof. 
but the video was done with yeah. children. We're done with children. Yeah. So when possible, you can't always, but if possible, like in, in the example that Alex used today, if you can get kids, get them. If you can. Yeah. If you, you if know, you can. I would just say, so one of my, one of the most shocking things to me, however, was um, I had my kids out there putting out flyers when we, I had Aaron Brockovich come to town and um, I was, we were putting out flyers on people's cars just to let them know that Aaron Brockovich was coming. And I had turned and I looked and way far across the parking lot, a guy had walked up to my son who was five years old at the time. And I saw him read it, wad it up and throw it in my son's face. And I, I joke all the time because, you know, I am a fourth degree black belt and that was my baby. And I could not get to that guy fast enough. I, I, I joke that I, I'm glad I didn't get there before he climbed in his truck and drove away because I probably would have been arrested. <laughs> But yeah, so, you know, I, I always do say to parents too, though, is don't underestimate the ugliness of the other side with your well, child. Well, I think that's a great segue to the another point that you made that you realize you were either had won or were winning when one of the opposition made the snide yeah. comment at the EPA yeah. meeting. We know who you are. Did, did he call you Alex? Do you remember yes. what he called you? He called you Alex. There you go. Yep. Using your yep. first name. So that's yep. another put down. Yeah. We know who oh, you are, Alex. Absolutely. It, I didn't even get all, I didn't even get all read out before he interrupted and said that it was, it was well staged, you know, on his, on his side. Yeah. It was, um, it was, but it was a tactic and you, and you recognize that on the spot. Good for you. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was a strategy. It was a tactic yes. to make you uncomfortable, to make you um, self-conscious. And, 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 and this is so important. I don't know. I, I don't know if you're just naturally like this, but it isn't about Alex. No. It, no. It, right? I and, had so many other things to do in my life than this. Yeah. And Alex knew this wasn't about Alex. Yeah. And so the day that, the, that the, uh, I'll call him a gentleman, I'll be polite, uh, use that strategy. Mm -hmm. What my guest remembered, it isn't about her. And the fact that he tried to make it about her is, right. a, is a sign that he's worried and they're yep. scared. Yep. And, and they're trying the attack the messenger which is the most, the oldest fallacious um, argument in, in, in history, attack the messenger. The, yep. And, and I, that's, I'm so glad that you pounded that point because uh, an aha moment for me following that was probably about six months later. Now, and for your audience, um, the town that I was, I, we've since moved, but the town that we were in, it was, a huge number of people in that town were employed by one of those three cement plants. And one day, one of my daughter's soccer coaches asked me if I could just um, take over a few games for him while he was out. And I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. And he said, um, I said, are you okay? I'm, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not trying to get in your business, but are you okay? And he said, no. And he goes, so, you know, when you uh, have a bowel movement and you got blood in your stool, and I remember thinking, ah, oh, no, I've never had that. Well, he worked at one of the cement plants. And so it was common practice for a lot of those guys to have blood in their stool. And so common practice that what they would, if blood showed up in one of their, their um, samples, then they had to use, it was a family leave act and they had to stay out. They had to stay away from the cement plant for X amount of days. I don't know how many until things got better. And so that meant that he couldn't be doing other things. So I took over and um, it was a couple years later that he came back to me and he said, I really appreciate what you were doing when you were doing it. And there, I know there was a lot of people who got after you, but I really appreciate it. And so it took a long time for that to happen, but you know, he, it was so commonplace for him that he thought that was normal, that he would actually say to me, you know how, no, you're right. So sometimes you're fighting for people who not only don't appreciate what you're fighting for, they don't understand it. And, and so that you have to keep that in mind too. That was sort of my inner strength there for a while. Yeah. That is a, such a good point. That yeah. is an incredibly good point. And, and keep, keep that, that can t tuck that away in your mind as you go forward 
and, oh, yeah. and, and that could explain a lot of the pushback that you're getting. Why am I getting pushback? Why are these people pushing back? It, they don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you realize the ton, and I'm not talking a few pounds, the tonnage that mercury, lead, toluene, benzene, all cancer causing agents, they, they mutate G DNA. And this is being emitted into the atmosphere by the tonnage. And I'm looking around and I can't understand what, why am I one of the few people shocked by this? But when they pay your salary and they tell you, oh, it's okay, you believe it. And that's kind of what was happening there. And anyway, it happens all the time everywhere. So it, it but it, but it can be broken. You, right. You can right. break through and you did. So the, I, I thought it was so interesting when you, when you spoke about the, the big, the, the big block um, in, in the very, in the very first story that you talked about where uh, the, with the bobsled team, with the women's bobsled team, that you couldn't have a women's bobsled team because of, there were no bylaws. Well, you took care of that detail. And in, in my book was whispered in water. Uh, it, I don't want to give away the whole climax, but the big breakthrough was getting a journal published in a, in a, uh, I, I'm going to, um, Jess, I'm going to restart right now. That's my producer. Okay. <laughs> the big breakthrough was when we got an article published in a scientific journal. Oh yeah. And that yeah, geek, yeah. That's geeks work. That's yeah, what academics yeah. do, but yeah. that's what we did. And that was the big breakthrough. This, this retelling of the flooding of New Orleans, the real story was published in an academic journal. And then a story about that was in the New York times. Okay. But it right. was geek work. It was yeah. geek work. It was oh. writing and researching. And that was, it, it wasn't anything pretty and colorful. That kitty video that we did, as effective mm -hmm. as it was, that was not the be all end all. That didn't change the world. It was nitty gritty work um, sitting at a desk. Okay. And like I said, then it's problematic for the bad guys because now you're not just this hysterical woman but you've actually got science and academia and scholars and research behind you. And that's a lot harder to put down. Yeah. Impossible. Impossible, yeah. really. Yeah. That's and, awesome. And, and the same, same with you, Alex, is not, not only were you this, this uh, maverick who thought she could show up and have a female bobsled team, but now, uh oh, it's, it's in writing. Yes, you yeah. can. Yeah. yeah. You know, Love it's it. funny because when I first announced to my husband that I was going to try out for the women's bobsled team, he was like, what? You don't know how to bobsled. And I was like, I know, but nobody does. Someone's got to do it. And I was, you know, I was big talking and it was all good until that first time I was standing on top of the mountain about to jump into this metal capsule and go down this, this ice slope, you know, 90 miles an hour. And I thought, I don't know, Bob sitting. What am I doing? Why am I here? <laughs> so you do. It is funny. You know, when you look back on sometimes you, you, you are so passionate about something. I have to write this wrong. And then you suddenly realize, why am I here? But it's, it's all good. It always ends well. I have to admit the the two of the most fright, frightening, scary things for me to watch. And at the winter Olympics, are the high jump ski jump, the, where they're yeah, jumping, Nordic ski um, jump. Yep. miles in the air and the bobsled to me those are the most and frightening that i'm that i hold my breath the entire time fortunately it's, it's only it's over quickly two, yeah and it's funny you say those two sports because those were the two that until 2002 women weren't allowed nordic ski I, jumping either i had yeah. no idea yeah because they said that women were the the argument in both cases that women weren't strong enough um, or durable enough to take the crashes that are involved in those two sports. It's like, but downhill ski is okay. You know, it, it, there was no argument. It was just, it came down to money and they didn't want to share. Yeah. Well, I, you learn something every day. Yeah. I love it. I love yeah. it. And then I have to, I can't let it pass. How did you end up getting invited to an EPA hearing? That, that was a coup. So how did that come about? Um, I had really, I got to give this to Aaron Brockovich, um, because I was able to speak to Aaron Brockovich and I got her to come to, again, through another contact, like you said, no one does this alone. So I had a friend who went to school with Aaron and then she reached out to Aaron and I got Aaron to come to Midlothian and that 
was, of course, interesting to a lot of reporters. And so then the next thing we knew, I had a lot of reporters and was giving interviews. And so, and once, once you get your name out there, and you know this as an author too, once, once you get that first book, once you get your name out there, it, things get a lot easier. But it's a lot of times, it's just getting out there. It's really difficult. I've done a lot of um, clinics for writers and um, they always ask, how did you get published? And I say, well, it's easy. You have to become a professional pregnant bobsledder. And then it's all downhill from there. <laughs> and even though I joke about it, the re it's, you have to have something different. You had that as an activist for to, to get published. And to, act, to anyone listening who is trying to decide, what can I do? How can I fight this company or whatever? You, you just you have to find what works for you, but what makes you different? What makes your story different? Because reporters have covered a thousand protests. Why is yours different? What makes it special? What's the human component and the interest factor there? And that's how you go. And that's, so for me, it was Aaron. And, and once my name was out there, then the EPA was listening. Well, I, I'm really glad you brought up the um, issue of a celebrity. Now, there is no rule that you have to have a celebrity no. to win your cause. None. However, that said, if you can get one, yeah. get one. Right. If, if you can, because the value of a celebrity name attached to your cause is critical. And I, I, did, I did the same thing. My connection with, with the great actor John Goodman was that oh, his nice. daughter and my son were in the same class since pre-K. And, oh. and, and 15, uh, I'm sorry, 10 years later, they've been in the same class all those years. I asked my son to ask Molly, the daughter Molly, would her dad be interested in doing a, a short public service announcement for levies.org, my organization? And, um, and he agreed. And when it was all said and done, I turned to my son and said, well, well, Stanford, one thing for sure, you must never have pushed Molly down in, in the playground. <laughs> because yeah, if yeah. you had, she would never <laughs> have, never have made the connection to her dad. But, but, um, but really, all, fun, all funny aside, if you can get one, get one. Yeah. The, 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 no question to the value of celebrity. But, but, but then in closing, you, you just utilize what you can. And again, there's no rule that you have to have a big name celebrity, none whatsoever. Right. Right. Because right. it's, I call it in my classes, it's click to visit, click to because everybody just clicks, you know, and they'll, they'll click. And so you have, that's why you got to find that giant giant Rick Perry head or Aaron Brockovich, you have to find John Good, some way, there's just something that catches people's attention. And then once Keep you get trying. their attention, right. And if right. something doesn't work, it's okay. Just right. try something else. And as my sister and I like to say, if you throw enough things at the wall, something has to stick. Right, right. So, yeah. well, Alex, is there any other, um, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners to give them encouragement and empowerment? You know, I'll tell you something I tell, so I don't know who is listening, but I'll, um, for this, I'm gonna direct it to younger people. Um, I, a lot of times I'll go to high schools as well. Um, and I, I always say to them, how often have you heard older, older people, boomer, and you'll have, you'll have you know, boomers say, oh, well, you guys just, your work ethic isn't the same. You don't care, you don't know, you don't understand. And I tell these kids, I'm very excited for this young generation. I really am, despite all the negative things that we hear all the time. These kids are phenomenal. And I think that we do a disservice to our world um, when we keep telling our kids, you don't appreciate, you don't respect, you don't know. We, because we're, we're kind of beating them down. And I think it's time that we start raising them up because they are phenomenal. And I can't imagine how overwhelming uh, the internet and all these things would have been if I was a young person. And so, you know, I tell them all the time, I, I think you're navigating it pretty well. You guys could sure do better, but start, start finding that thing that you're passionate about and help make this world a better place and forget what you keep being told that you, you can or you won't or you shouldn't because you can and you will and you should. And so I would just say, just, Keep an open mind, be proud of yourself. 
but also just remember to find that common ground, keep your sense of humor and your love. And just when the other person seems so ugly or uncaring, just take a deep breath. I know this sounds really zen, but take a deep breath and just say, you know what? They're uninformed. They don't know any better. And just sort of, you know, as Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. And I, I all the time, you know, just go high and change the world. And I, so I, I love our younger generation so much. That's well, I think that's brain. great advice, not only for the younger generation, but for all of us. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, that's true. I tell, I tell my three children, if they ever catch me acting old, tell yeah. me, please tell me. So, yes. <laughs> so thank you so much again, Alex Allred, for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Yes. Hey, stay Thank with you, me. Sandy. Stay with me one second. Okay.